She has a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling from New York University and attended Missouri State for undergrad. She lived, she's lived in Columbia for 15 years with her husband, Jim, and their two sons, Zachary and Jacob. She was recently awarded recognition by the Salvation Army as a woman getting things done in the community. <laughs> All right. Yours. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here to talk about uh, services for independent living. Um, we have been in the community a while. Um, we're gonna screen share a PowerPoint with you all. And so I'll go through the PowerPoint and then um, and talk about SIL and what we do. And then if you have questions, we will make certain that we have time for questions. I do have a hard stop at one o'clock. Okay, how's that grab you? Yep. So um, there was an announcement, like uh, Scott Crystal did do a, uh, put out a wonderful announcement, but I am not the executive director of SIL. Um, Patrick Lee is our executive director. Um, like Sarah said, I am the director of advocacy development and outreach. Um, all right, next slide. So SIL empowers people um, with disabilities, seniors and veterans to maximize their independence in the community and we envision a barrier free community. And part of our name, right, Services for Independent Living um, goes to the independent living philosophy. Um, it calls for the rights of every person to make their own decisions about their own life and participation in the community. And it requires, um, you know, removing physical and attitudinal barriers that we have in society towards people with disabilities. Um, just a little bit, because you guys are, because we have so many professors and things and meal skinners, et cetera. Um, just a little bit of history. Ed Roberts is known as the father of independent living. And way back in 62, um, he, uh, fought to get into the University of California at Berkeley, um, had, to de had to defy all sorts of folks and um, get voc rehab in California to even agree that he could have a job. Um, he was a person who um, was on a ventilator and um, had an, uh, what they then called an iron lung. So he was on a respirator um, and he had, so he had multiple physical disabilities, um, but his, uh, you know, had no acquired um, intellectual disabilities. And kind of around this time is when people started to think that their children, um, not just adults, but their children with disabilities, maybe didn't need to be institutionalized in a medical model all the time. And so essentially the independent living philosophy is that people with disabilities um, are the best experts on their own needs and have the right to support, um, to receive support to develop autonomy. And that is what we do at SIL. And back in 19, some of you may be familiar with the 1974 Rehabilitation Act. Um, so this says 1972, there was a federal grant at Berkeley to establish the first center for independent living. So we are, a, we are services for independent living. We call ourselves SIL, but there are SILs with a CILS, so Centers for Independent Living, um, were born out of all of these fights and were mandated by the um, 1974 504 Rehabilitation Act. Um, we are all mandated, um, it is a national mandate, um, and there are five core services, which are peer support, information and referral, individual and systems advocacy, and independent living skills training, along with transition care. So in the United States, there are 403 SILs. Um, and in Missouri, there are 21 SILs. Up there in the right hand, up in the top corner, Merrill, um, we had 22, so I just changed my slide, but I haven't changed my map yet. Um, so Merrill just closed, uh, closed and merged with another agency and will no longer be a SIL for up in the northwest um, region of Missouri. And right now we are configuring who will cover that um, part of the state. But we also have a um, MOSOL, which is our Missouri um, Services for Independent Living Center, Center Statewide Council. And we also have a SILP. We are all regulated by Voc Rehab, which is in Missouri through DESE, the Department of um, Education. So 
still has been here, Services for Independent Living, has been here in Columbia since 1980. So we've been around a long time. Um, we've had a lot of uh, iterations. Um, we were one of the first four centers to be established in Missouri. So we actually get federal funding directly, along with pass-through funding from the state. Um, we serve seven counties, Boone, Cooper, Howard, Randolph, Audrain, Callaway, and Montgomery. And in 2014, we merged or took over um, the Boone, Council, uh, Boone County Council on Aging. This is just a quick breakdown. Um, the, the, the graph is better. Like we have, um, we are mostly funded by fee-for-service programs that are um, through uh, government and government grants. Example of that, a fee-for-service. So our fee-for-service contracts are mostly Medicaid. So we get, we receive Medicaid reimbursement for um, community, our home and community-based services, which we'll talk about. Um, and, and we also do some um, uh, transportation fee for service contracts. Um, everywhere I go, I tell everybody who funds us locally. So the city, United Way, Missouri Assistive Technology, these are our big funders. We have more than our five core services now, but um, we still mostly all of these things address those five core services. And this is just to give you a, like, I know it's hard to read, but it just sort of tells you that we've got a lot of different programming. So we have access services, we have an accessible uh, transportation program, um, I, you know, community outreach, then we have our business offices and what we call home and community community based services, which um, is attendant care. Um, a lot of the things that we do, so our core services, we um, I briefly mentioned them before, but advocacy which is a lot what I do, which is systems advocacy, which is I'm at city council, I'm at the commission office, I go to um, Jeff City to talk about um, bills and legislation that affects us um, at the city council level. It's things like uh, water and uh, utility bills and what that looks like. Um, and then we have, uh, and I do our federal stuff. Um, we also provide individual advocacy. So sometimes people call and they'll say, I'm struggling with like um, a person at work or this business treated me badly. Can you call them and I will interact with them. It's all right. This is, hey guys, we are at the Boone County Democratic office today. It's hopping. And we, it's hopping. We got lots of people here. So if occasionally somebody walks by, it's because we are so crowded. There's only one way in and one way out today, which is awesome. Um, we also do some information referral. People call us all day long. We probably get 200 calls a day right. with people asking. So we have one person whose job it is to just answer information and referral questions. Um, we do some independent living skills training and that program is changing. Um, right now, uh, I actually am, I will put a plug in here if anyone knows folks, I am looking for a part-time um, independent living skills person to help with our senior programming um, and a new youth um, independent living skills person who will be working with Columbia Public Schools, which we'll talk about again. Then we do peer and support mentoring. Um, we do transition services. Transition services are kind of odd, frankly. People don't really think about them, but we are talking about with kids, it's usually transitioning from middle school to high school. Maybe it's transitioning from at home education to um, in the school system um, education. And it's also post-secondary and employment training for when kids leave high school. Um, and it may be like transitioning from an educational support system like CPS into like the Department of Mental Health um, and Voc Rehab as their primary forms of support. And then for adults, um, we talk about uh, moving folks from institutionalized care. So say you have a stroke and you go and you are living independently, you go into the hospital, they make you go to Rusk Rehab and, and you needed something that would make your home livable for you so they'll let you go back into your home. And we work on that. Um, and sometimes we help people transition out of um, like nursing home care and back into the community. And then our, we have 
home and community-based services, which um, we call HCBS, which is personal care. And um, it can get really weedy, um, but we have uh, both what we call consumer-directed services, where um, a consumer is, an, is the actual employer, but we act as their third-party HR specialist sort of person. And that's all Medicaid that you have to be, um, you have to have you can qualify for Medicaid. And there's a whole community plan that, uh, plan that comes from the state that we are just given and then we help implement. And then there's attendant care where we have our own home care attendants that we um, employ that go into folks' homes. And we do that, that can both be Medicaid and it can be private pay. We also have um, nursing care so currently we have one full-time RN and um, we have some part-time uh, nurses that uh, work with us also. Additionally. Great. We have a transportation program. Um, transportation is the weakest portion of our um, programming right now. We have six, we have six vehicles that are accessible um, and, but we don't have currently have six drivers. We have struggled since COVID to actually maintain drivers. And um, we have the same issues as the city bus department and paratransit. Um, all of us are, I will say that transportation is the biggest issue for people who are disabled or age, trying to age um, in place. Uh, not having a ride makes it very difficult to get places. Um, all right, then we have a program called Senior Connect. Um, it has case management, service coordination, um, information and referral, case management and service coordination. I really think of it as the same thing. Our funders call them different things, um, but really it's, uh, we connect seniors who are, you have to be 55, um, you have to be in Boone County. So we don't actually have a Senior Connect program in our other six counties that we serve currently. I would like to get there. And we're working on that. Um, and then we we have uh, two full time case managers who work with um, seniors. And depending on where you live in the city, they do different things. Um, Tell me the city. Well, now I would say ninety one percent of our seniors that we serve are in Columbia. Um, we have a small contingency that is outside of Columbia, and mostly what we do with the folks who are in Boone County as a broader place, our volunteer um, uh, driven activities with them, which is like friendly visiting, uh, grocery shopping, um, uh, running errands for people. We'll have uh, like coming up um, next week is a United Way um, week of action, I think it's called, but it's um, for, so it used to be a day of action and next this year it's gonna be a week. So we'll have some um, group projects um, where folks are going out uh, to do larger group projects at people's homes. And those are not all in um, Columbia City. So that's kind of stuff. We have, um, we've always had a volunteer program. We have always asked people to volunteer with us and to pair them up with um, seniors, but we are rolling out um, a specific where we call it sunshine for seniors volunteer program. Um, you are the first to see this. So if anybody thinks that this, like our logos cruddy or anything doesn't work there, um, let me know. Cause uh, we have not actually, you are the very first ones to see this. Um, but we have our adopted grandparents um, stuff, which is friendly visiting. And essentially we're trying to reduce social iso isolation. And I will tell you, like, I'm 54 years old. When we talk about, like, seniors, like, qualifying at 55, I'm like, I don't really know that I feel like I'm, I'm a senior. But I will tell you that the majority of the people that we serve are actually 65 and older. And we have a large contingency that are actually 75 and older. Um, and... I would love to talk about a paradigm shift in how we discuss services for people and who qualifies and what that looks like because many of us are extremely active um, until we're like 75 or so. But we do air and running technology help with folks and group yard projects like I just said, which um, 
our Sunshine for Senior program. We also have volunteers who volunteer in other programs um, in the agency. Then we have accessibility services. So I'm going to start putting some pictures up because pictures are more fun than words, frankly. Um, we do some home repair and modifications. We have both direct HUD funding that we can use out um, in our seven county region. And then we have pass through CDBG money, which is from the city of Columbia. Um, both of them are pretty small. And I will say that we are, we have a waiting list right now for this program. So if someone calls and says, um, my fence broke and I need it fixed by Friday. We don't do crisis um, uh, stuff like that. And we can't just pivot that quickly. It's usually about a two or three month process because there's just so much paperwork, um, but we still have a waiting list. We build mostly ramps and um, are doing bathroom accessibility things in people's homes. Hopefully at some point we will have a, um, you can go to the next slide. Hopefully we will have um, a fee for service program uh, in the next year or so where people could call and um, we wouldn't have to rely on the CDBG funding. Um, we have a DME exchange and assistive technology program. This is our, what I would call flagship program. We um, give out over 1500 pieces of equipment, of durable medical equipment every year. And um, actually this year, it's probably gonna be double that. We moved into a new space. Um, I've got some pictures later of our new space. These are a couple of pictures of our new space, but. We do, um, we give away durable medical equipment. So what that means is we give away everything from finger braces or um, knee braces um, and uh, things like that, all the way up to hospital beds, um, uh, shower chairs, wheelchairs, commodes, um, uh, walkers, rollators, knee scooters, and our our um, durable medical exchange program is considered a recycling program. So people give us their old, their stuff that they've used and we determine if it's still usable, if it's, um, if it can be cleaned, if it can be sanitized and then if it can, or if it just needs a little bit of repair, we fix it and then we give it back out in the community and then people give us those things back. Um, this fall, we will also start selling um, some new power wheelchairs and um, lift chairs. Like I had never heard of them before I worked for, but um, they look like lazy boy recliners, but they will stand you completely up um, or variation levels in between. Um, and so we will start uh, being a retail option um, for those here in the community um, this fall. We also, um, Missouri, uh, um, back on our funding, we have Mo AT. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, we've got MoAT, so we do demonstrations of technology for people as well. I want to say um, about our DME program, there's no means testing, right? So anybody can call us. If you need crutches or you need a wheelchair or you need a walker, you can be unhoused and call. And I have literally like loaded things up and met people on corners and given them stuff. But you can also be, I've had folks call from City Hall and be like, you know, I need a knee scooter for a week because mine's not going to come in fast enough or my insurance hasn't covered it yet. And we give them a knee scooter. We don't ask you why you need it. We don't um, demand to know how much money you make. Um, anybody can use our DME program. And uh, that is the beauty of it because really and we get them from all over the place. Um, we get stuff. People call me from Nebraska to donate equipment. I generally tell them to like, I find them still closer to them that has a program, but we get stuff from all over Mid-Missouri. So on the horizon, well, coming up, like we have been expanding, we just moved into a new location and I've got some pictures coming up of that, but we will be doing ADA compliance audits for businesses. We used to do those for those people who are um, familiar with um, services for independent living over the last couple of decades, we have, um, we previously used to do that for businesses. Um, so we have a certified ADA coordinator on staff and um, that means your business can call and ask us um, to come and see if you are compliant. 
And um, that will be a fee for service program and for private businesses, not for profits can call us. And depending on how big you are, how established and what's going on, we'll talk about a fee um, for your program. We also currently with ADA compliance, we already, we started this year working with the clerk's office um, to make certain that all of our polling places are ADA compliance. Um, and that's really interesting because it's not that like uh, the clerk makes certain that all the, the machines and all of the voting equipment and all of the people who work at the polls are trained, but the actual physical spaces, you all know that here in Columbia, we go to churches, we go to schools, some places are up and down stairs. So we have to figure out if there are slopes. Like, so we are literally looking at the physical space to make certain that folks um, in wheelchairs and things can uh, access the polls easily. Um, we will be expanding our youth and transition programming. Um, we, I will say that we have not been doing very much with youth and transition. So this year, um, we just got, uh, we just established ourselves as a partner in education with CPS. We will be partnering this coming year, specifically with Hickman and um, Douglas, but also probably the Career Center. And we are gonna be going into classrooms and delivering services directly into the classrooms. You all may or may not know, we are often short staffed um, in our schools for uh, special ed and teaching all the time. We don't have enough teachers. Um, and so we can go in and assist by offering um, some curriculums and doing some things for the school that they would like to do, but maybe the teacher doesn't have time or they could just use an extra person in there because when you have kids with disabilities, um, it often requires more bodies um, to get the same results as you would in a classroom with uh, kids without disabilities. And so we're also gonna be doing our pre ETS program in 2025 in the summer. So that is pre-employment training services. And right now Mizzou does pre-employment training services during the school year for CPS. And we will be partnering and bridging and providing um, employment training over the summer through the summer school program. So it'll be free to all families. Um, and we had tried this a few years ago, uh, but I don't think there were the um, appropriate supports in place for it. But this year we will, um, we will have all of those appropriate um, supports in place for next year. And part of that plays into the next thing, which we, are, we will be um, starting an employment services program this fall. Um, so we will be hiring, I hope to have um, our new employment coordinator in place by October. Um, and they will be um, focusing on individuals with acquired um, brain injuries and neurocognitive deficits and disabilities, which means like somebody had a stroke, or they were in a car crash, um, or possibly it's a vet coming back from, um, and they had a traumatic brain injury or an amputee or spinal cord disorder. And we will be working with them specifically in voc rehab to get them back into competitive integrative um, employment. Um, we will also be doing that with youth. Um, and so part of that pre program will feed into that um, eventually. And then how can you help? So our durable medical equipment program, our biggest program is pretty much unfunded. Um, we pay for it out of uh, overhead and fees out of general revenue, but we are always looking for, um, it is the thing that I am working on this year the most um, in development is getting someone to fund our DME program. And then of course we always need volunteers um, and we have volunteers, you know, volunteers to do everything from our Sunshine for Seniors program to administrative work um, and working in our DME equipment. We have interns who, um, folks who come in and just help us clean equipment. We get so much equipment um, and it all has to be cleaned and it's not that difficult to clean. It's just, it takes a long time. Um, we have in September, Friday, September 13th, we will be doing our active and aging health and resource fair. This is really about our eighth year doing um, the Active and Aging Fair. Previous to that, it was I, uh, it was called the Mature Living Festival. Um, no one on staff was here when it was the Mature Living Festival, but um, 
And it used to be at Parkade and then it was at the mall. But this year it'll be at the farmer's market, like at the MU Health Pavilion. And um, we have really expanded it this year. I think it's going to be great. We will have um, all the vendors that we normally have that uh, work with and cater to the um, active and aging um, market. But we are also going to be highlighting um, seniors and, and people over 55 who are artists. So if you are an artist or a crafter or um, a maker or whatever you use to describe yourself, an artisan of any kind, and you make your own um, stuff, you can get a booth with us and um, you can sell your wares at this um, event. It's a pretty short event. It's nine um, to one. And um, the weather's generally really nice. It'll all be covered and people will be able to drive right up to their booth space this year, which is different. Um, we're really hoping that this Mosey is gonna be playing um, and there are gift drawings and things, but we're hoping that uh, this will be better. We're also gonna be, since we're at the farmer's market, there will be some gardening. So, like we'll be doing some things with the folks around us because the ARC, the farmer's market, and then um, our new building, we are all in the same block. Um, and we are really looking forward to all those collaborations. So our old location, um, just some, you know, for people who have known where we are, because honestly, people are still taking things to the old location, um, which is now owned by Woodhaven. Um, and they drop stuff off at the door all the time. I would say like at least once a week, somebody from Woodhaven calls and says, hey, somebody just dropped a wheelchair to us. Can you come get this? Or, you know, when can we drop this off? Um, so we have moved. Uh, we used to be at Hathman Place, but now we are on Ash at 1905 West Ash. We are, um, that is the old Boone Electric Building. And before that, it was a shelter claims um, adjustment place for many years. So um, it looks really small, but it's actually very large. Um, and then this is what, our offices at Halfman Place look like. This was both our demonstration area and our storage space. Plus we had a pod outside and um, another storage unit. I mean, it was crazy, not accessible at all. If you were in um, a wheelchair or you needed a walker, we often had to make a path or we'd have to sit you someplace else and bring stuff to you. I mean, it was crazy how much stuff, like I don't even know how we did it. But that's the before, and this is our new storage space for just our DME equipment. We have um, almost 6,000 square feet just for um, the DME um, stuff. And you can, if you're donating things, you pull right up to our driveway doors and um, there's a doorbell um, or you can call and someone will come and open the, the garage doors. Um, you can always just drop off stuff. We like for people to make appointments if they're trying to pick up equipment. So we like pickup to be Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday between nine and four. Um, and that's because we have so much equipment now that we need two days a week for our staff to be out in the field picking up things and um, installing things. Because if you get a, a hospital bed from us, we do not expect you to come pick it up, nor do we expect you to know how to put it together or how to make it work. We will bring it to your house. We will install it. We will show you how to make it work. Um, and if you have questions, then we go back out and help um, with managing those. And we do have some complicated things like hospital beds, lifts, chairs, um, lifts that literally they come crank and they come electric that move people from um, power wheelchairs into beds and things like that. So um, we need our folks to be able to be out in the community a couple of days a week. This is our new demonstration center. So before we really had like a table and a whole bunch of crud really just packed on top of it because we did not have the space. But now we have this beautiful demonstration center where people can come and um, if you have a communication disorder, we have a lot of equipment right here for you to try. We don't sell um, uh, any of this technology. What we do is we demonstrate it um, and we are the biggest demonstration center for MOAT um, in the state, but we demonstrate it and then we will help you figure out how to get it. So we have the forms and, and how to pay for it if um, that is an issue as well. 
Um, so I encourage people to come check out our space, um, you know, call us and see if you can come by and look. And then a tour, a small tour of our new building. So like this meeting is a hybrid meeting and you have this owl. But as you know, there's ambient noise here, right? We've got um, the furnace. Um, when people walk in and out, it makes a lot of noise. So our big conference room has about, um, we have these crazy dynamic microphones that are in the ceiling all over the place. It amounts to about 200 microphones so that literally you can whisper. So if I were like, and you were like, I can't hear her, what she's saying, you can actually hear the whisper um, via Zoom in the room. Um, we also have a, a large camera system that pans the whole room. So our large conference room actually holds um, 65 people, the fire marshal says. I like to say if you want chairs and tables, really probably no more than 40 because we run out of space. Um, uh, if you want more than 40 chairs, then I have to get them from somebody else too because that's about how many chairs we have. But the space is rentable um, or if we're collaborating with an organization. So um, we collaborate with orgs all the time. Like today is where Orange, we will be collab collaborating with Moms Demand on a gun survivor's breakfast in July um, in this space. And that is because disability, like people sometimes are like, well, why would you all um, work with them? But the collaboration is that gun violence often does not only kill people, but it causes permanent disability. And so we have a lot of folks who in our community and other communities around us that have are in wheelchairs or have a traumatic brain injury. Um, and they all have to then relearn. Those are acquired disabilities. Um, so we're gonna be partnering with them in that space. We also have our little conference room. So if you come and you need breakout space, we have breakout spaces as well. Um, this is our, our new kitchen. It is so much bigger. Um, so for uh, renting, it depends on how long and how, um, you know, how often and, and that sort of thing. But generally we're at um, $50. We're not very expensive for about uh, three or four hours. Yeah. Um, and then we have things for, um, like we have a kitchen. So you can have catering services come in. You can have food brought in or you can, we have an oven. And I'm into microwaves and that giant refrigerator. Um, so we have already had a couple of groups, uh, state disability groups have had meetings in our space. Um, we have coffee crafts and things like that that people can use. But this is our kitchen and our kitchen, you, it's kind of, um, we have not painted um, the part under the sink, but you can roll your wheelchair up to the sink and then you can roll your wheelchair over to the oven and there are really fancier ovens that are more ADA compliant that open with like an apron door. But I don't know if you've ever looked at apron door ovens, but they are extremely expensive. And most people that we serve are never going to be able to afford an apron door oven. So um, this oven is ADA compliant in that it's two small ovens stacked on top of each other in the range. And it has push buttons as opposed to dials. So if something has dials, it's never gonna be ADA compliant. It always has to be something that you don't have to twist, bend, or that you could use a pencil or a stylus to um, turn on. And that, that was brought to us by uh, Boone Electric um, Foundation, they're great. Our new space also has three power wheelchair accessible bathrooms. Um, so we do have a whole nother set of bathrooms that are manual wheelchair accessible, which is what you see most places, but turning radius for power wheelchairs um, is a lot. So um, we actually have, this is our uh, left. We have a right and another left. <laughs> like, so if you're left-handed, you know, or maybe your strength is pulling yourself to the left, then we direct you to one. If your strength is pulling yourself to the right, we have another. Um, and so then if you, you know, this is my contact information. Um, and I always talk fast because I really prefer having a conversation about different things that folks might have questions about. So, and yeah, and you can unshare that or, and yeah, we'll see, I think there might be some questions in chat that I've been hiding. Yeah, let's, do, 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 let's do, do. talk. Uh, Ruth, um, hopefully you just saw her email address. 
And, and maybe somebody can type it in the chat if they want. Um, Dave will do it in just a second because he's really good. Won't you, Dave Taylor? <laughs> Kathy Jensen asks, what C A R F? CARF. So, and um, CARF, CARF accreditation um, is, oh my gosh, I'm going to forget it right now that you asked me this, but it's um, assisted rehabilitation um, facilities. So, a credit, it's a certification for assisted rehabilitation <laughs> facilities. But CARF accreditation is a higher accreditation. Um, there are not that many cells with it. Um, and you see hospitals have CARF accreditation and places like Rust. Um, and we are not a rehabilitation facility, but CARF covers a lot of different kinds of programming. And for us to do the employment services that we are doing, um, we are uh, gonna become CARF accredited. And generally what that means in a program style is you always have to produce the program, do the program, follow all the CARF rules and not be funded by anybody. And then you get the accreditation. So they come in and look at your program once you put it up. So um, all of that will start this fall. Any other questions? Dave had the statement about New County poll workers election judges can also bring sign in iPad and a ballot outside of the polling place for any voter. Yes. So I'm a polling supervisor too. So if you have a disability mm -hmm. and you cannot and you want to you want to vote at the polling place, you can come to the polling place and now, the one thing is you need to bring someone with you who can come in and ask for a poll worker to come out because we won't know that you want us to come out to the car, but we will come out um, to the car to um, deliver a ballot and um, that in our county clerk, you can also be on the permanent absentee voter list. So um, if you have a um, disability, um, our clerk will put you on the permanent disability list um, and they deliver, she, like her office, they are such great folks, but they deliver ballots directly to people's homes um, a lot of the time. It happens every election, um, they're amazing. So here in Boone County, we are really lucky. We don't usually have any complaints about um, people with disabilities accessing the polls, which is very different from other counties um, in our state. Um, we have a really great clerk who works really hard at making things accessible. If you ever have any questions about accessibility or doubts about accessibility, um, you can call the clerk's office and they will really right then and there solve that problem for you. But we also have universal polling places. So if your polling place um, turns out to be not as accessible, we do have a couple in town where there are stairs. Um, there are other places that you can go that are always accessible that anybody can go to vote at. So, have you had any problem with the expiration of Medicaid uh, insurance that was originally allotted during the COVID era? So, I will say that, you know, um, Missouri is what it is. We uh, do not always have the, uh, like we have safety net services here. Um, we have pretty stringent rules, but every year with Medicaid um, and Medicare, we have problems with people getting kicked off for what I would call specious reasons. Um, other people would call, you know, like, uh, you know, like you forgot your, you put the wrong zip code in or you didn't check a box on the form and you get kicked off. Um, Right now, like this past legislative session, frankly, I worked on um, our whole Mosul Advocacy Committee. So because we have 21, we work together. Because we do receive state funding for consumer-directed services, we do um, get, uh, you have to be on Medicaid, you have to qualify for all of those things. We have a program in the state called Ticket to Work, where people can work, but they can only work to certain um, asset levels. And then um, once they get to certain spaces, then they um, if they make too much, our state will immediately, like if they can't, like they'll kick you off like the program or kick you out of your Medicaid or your services. So um, I will say that every year, our Mosul Advocacy Committee is in Jeff City um, working on keeping people enrolled in the programs, um, working with both the state 
um, offices on statute and policy um, implementation, but also with the legislature on how to fund all of that, because we also get unfunded mandates. Um, so we do have people getting kicked off of um, services. Um, and we are uh, collecting, like if you have a story, like you got kicked off, um, like you had, you, um, you are eligible for CDS or in-home care. Um, we have people call us and say, like, they took my, they took my services away. And then we work on like what that looks like right now. Um, we are collecting information around the state on several, um, different programs <laughs> that people have been, um, finding themselves on the outside of when they should have been on the inside. And sometimes, frankly, it's just as um, it is not so much that the program and statute doesn't say the thing, but that there's no institutional memory at our state offices and they have new people and they don't know the rules or how to implement programs because nobody really trained them effectively. Um, and so it's not that they were really trying to be punitive, but they act punitively. And, and the people who are on the receiving end of that are people with disabilities and seniors. Um, so I have two short questions. Uh -huh. um, one, uh, I, I did use your services when I had a, a foot surgery and it was great and I did <laughs> donate and you should encourage people to and because they don't always mention that. But, but um, were you able to promote your services to people like the social worker who meet two people before surgeries? You know, that are, because um, I know at some institutions and in some communities they can. So that's one question. And the second question is if you could take your hat off before you end and give us an update on your candidacy. So I missed your fundraiser. Um, we will, uh, like, that is a difficult thing because um, because uh, I'm yeah. here for services for independent living today. Okay. All right. Um, um, and um, so I won't even talk about that really. Okay. Um, but uh, in terms of remote services, we have um, caseworkers who travel all over, but we don't really do anything with the hospitals where someone is, um, like you said, like we don't do anything where somebody's about to go into surgery. Now, if you're already on our caseload, um, People, we work with people to make certain that they're, you know, literally like people will call and be like, I called 911 and my dog is here. Can somebody come get my dog? <laughs> um, and we'd have, we, you know, we've had things like that. Um, but we don't do, um, we don't have any um, uh, licensed social workers um, that work directly with um, folks. I'm not exactly certain, like no, you said, remote. I actually meant in the hospitals and lots of different communities, they will give you information on oh, things you're yes. doing after post-surgery so that those social workers- Oh, know who to meet. Yes, to so we do have, we have a really good collaborative relationship with Russ. Um, our uh, executive director actually was um, the CEO of Russ, uh, maybe like over about a decade ago. Um, and we have a really good relationship with Russ. Um, I actually, uh, go over there and work with their stroke support group um, pretty frequently this year. Um, but uh, so there are people who talk about our services. Um, I think more and more people are hearing about our DME equipment program. Um, that's the thing we get the most help from. Um, uh, Mizzou uh, uh, Therapy Services talks about us to people all of the time. Um, they're very supportive of us. Um, and uh, so we do have collaborative relationships with folks and, you know, but it's always one of those things where, I mean, we all know where it's our specialty and we talk to people all the time um, about it. And we think everybody knows, but really almost nobody knows. I mean, I, that's the premise that we go on in terms of marketing is that nobody knows who we are, even if they say they know who we are, they, they'll say, oh, services from, oh, I didn't know that you gave away durable medical equipment. Oh, I thought I had to be, um, you know, I thought I had to have a disability to get a piece of equipment from you or I, you know, people come with all sorts of preconceived notions. It's very hard to for people to believe that we give away, you know, upwards of, you know, half a million dollars worth of free medical equipment into the community um, every year. And, you know, people don't think everyone thinks there's means testing for that. Um, and there's not. So and there's no um, you don't have to qualify your disability with us. So. We are a 
oh, what I didn't say, most important, like we're consumer directed, right? So 51% of our staff um, have a self-identified disability and 50, um, right now we're at about 60% of our board, but by, by mandate, we have to be 50, 51% of our staff and board outside of direct care attendants and drivers um, have to have a disability. Um, and that is designed so that, you know, when we are providing services and deciding on policy, that um, people know that those people who have, you know, like I said earlier in the independent living philosophy, that people with perspective, people with knowledge about directly with their disability are weighing in on the services that we provide. Yeah, um, Kathy asks in the chat, how does SIL interface with private for-profit companies that provide durable medical equipment like hospital beds for people in hospice care, et cetera, because Medicare would pay for that? Um, so yes, I mean, so if you have insurance for things, particularly for things that are really big, like uh, power wheelchairs, we always have a wait list for. Um, we do not have uh, such a, like, occasionally we get brand new power wheelchairs from people. Um, this year it was candy apple red was the color this year. I think we got like four from various people not connected each other at all. Um, candy apple red power wheelchairs this year. But if you have um, something like a power wheelchair, which could cost upwards, depending on um, how fancy a wheelchair it is, might cost $10,000. Um, those we do actually, um, while we don't means test, like to determine if you can really afford it, what we do ask is like, some people will call and say, I need a walker and I need a power wheelchair. Well, if you need a walker, you don't need a power wheelchair. <laughs> um, and, and that's really just the truth. Um, so those things that are more expensive um, that we have fewer of, there is a waiting list for, and we do um, ask for some more information on the level of disability that people are experiencing and the, um, you know, and if they have Medicare, because we can help people fill out forms if they're struggling with that um, for things. But hospitals, I will tell you, I mean, it's not great that rural hospitals close in Missouri and they've all been closing. Um, but uh, when the one in um, Camden closed, um, they called us and we went and we got um, a lot of equipment from them. Now we can't take, we do not have the ability to take on a whole hospital worth of medical equipment. I wish we did because we would. Um, but if we had a big enough warehouse and we had um, a big enough staff and enough funding, we could take on more equipment than we currently have. Um, but like I said, we're all, also the question, we're going to start selling some things because we don't always have everything that someone wants. Like you can call us and say, do you have a scooter? But if we had a run on knee scooters last week and knee scooters are really popular. And if you don't, I'm talking about they're the ones where you put your knee on and you see people rolling around because they've got one leg and a like ankle brace or something. Um, those are really popular and they come and go. People really do return them um, when they're finished with them. But we'll get like a wave where, you know, people want wheelchairs or people want, um, you know, things, and then we'll get down to almost nothing. And then they all come rolling back in. It's kind of a, um, it's a really interesting thing, but we almost always have stuff, but maybe not exactly what you would like. We also have incontinent care, which I didn't talk about, but we give away incontinent care. Um, we also give away um, things like bed chucks and things like that. And so those are good. Like we have uh, um, pregnant moms that come in and ask for those things all the way up to, um, seniors in wheelchairs um, and things like that, or newly acquired wheelchair um, inhabitants who don't, who've never had um, a disability where that's required and their family's not quite used to like what their ordering process will be or how much they need, or they don't know which, which kind of incontinent care they want. And so they come in and get a variety of samples to try at home um, so they can try because that stuff is really expensive. Um, there are luxury taxes in this state applied to these things. So um, also yeah. you say if Medicare pays for it, but there's large co-pays. Sometimes there are large co-pays and not everybody can afford co-pays. Right. You're right. Um, and um, so that's why we don't ask. Um, we also have a really great relationship. Um, that's who I was missing. I was trying to figure out who I was missing on my slide. Um, the Assistance League of Mid-Missouri. Um, we have a really great collaborative relationship with them. 
um, where every month they bring us supplies um, for our senior boxes um, that we deliver to um, folks around town. Uh, Herb or Sue, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? It, it's, it's mine's, mine's more as a statement. I've used you folks for one thing. It's very helpful in the sense of when you're new to getting, not getting around as well as you expect used to, it's hard to know what you're looking for and you folks have a knowledge base. And I am glad to say that Alice did the same thing we did though when we got some equipment, we gave a donation too because we can afford it, but we appreciate the combination of things that you could give hints. I mean, I never heard of a thing to put socks on. I mean, all sorts of things that are, you know, some of them are fairly simple, but you've served a big service and I thank you. And, um, and uh, it's a wide spectrum of the population may actually, you, you can actually serve through their lifetime just because people have different needs at different ages. Absolutely. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. Um, yeah, like people don't always self-identify as having a disability, right? Like most of, I will tell you that most uh, people over 60, 65 who were um, able-bodied most of their lives, like a lot of people attribute uh, disability and they, they equate that with aging, but that is not necessarily the case. And so they'll be like, well, I'm old, so I need a walker now. But really it's like your mobility is decreasing, so you need a walker and you're actually developing a disability. Right, um, and people don't necessarily self-identify as having a disability. It's not anything they ever really thought about most of their lives, um, but they know they now need a walker or they now need a cane. Um, but we do have, Sue is right, we have a lot of options for people. So um, there's Parkinson's in my family and we have these spoons that will, you can hold that, like that practice grip holding that where you hold the spoon and no matter how shaky you are, the spoon stays still. Um, I mean, just like things like that. Um, we have a lot of uh, things for gripping and pulling different kinds of knives. People can come into our demonstration center and just try weighted spoons or, um, you know, we have everything from my grandfather used to use a um, magnifying glass that was just a big round magnifying glass that he would put on the newspaper to read the newspaper. But we have them from very big to really small to the kinds that like that have magnifying glasses that you can put over your regular glasses. We just have a lot of very interesting things that um, I have never like thought of, but you go in there and there's just like, you're just like, oh my gosh, let's play with this. What does this do? I mean, there's just all sorts of things in our demonstration center and we're always getting new ones. Um, plus we have a variety of technology like phones, and computer aids um, that you can come in and try to see if they will help you with your computer. I will say, we do not fix computers. We do not um, uh, upload and download software and troubleshoot um, technology, particularly. Sometimes people call and ask us to fix their computers. This is not a skill set we have. I have some volunteers who will volunteer to come and help people, but I don't have like um, the geek squad at my office. So, um, you know, a lot of times I do actually make referrals to the Geek Squad a lot of times um, or to someone who will do stuff. Um, yeah. One o'clock now. I really appreciate you all having us. Um, please reach out if you have any questions for Syl. Um, we are here and really rebuilding. Like I will say, like we've got a new space. We've got new programs coming. Um, we have a lot of new staff, and we are we welcome your questions and inquiries. Um, and if there's something that you feel like the city needs or the community needs that we are not providing, um, we are happy to at least hear that and see if we can help with that. Okay. Well, I'd like to close this presentation part of the meeting and open the regular meeting. We did not get this again because we're running late. But are there any candidates dropped here who would like to? Talk about this. Uh, so, yes, so my name is Shaman Schwak and I'm running for Boone County Public Administrator. Do you, do you have any opponents? Roger Johnson's online. I do not currently have any opponents, but um, I have until June 14th to get an opponent. So nice. we're waiting to see. Okay, thank you. Roger. 
He's not going to talk to us. He's just going to wave. <laughs> All right. Well, hello, everybody. And I'm Justin Oliver, uh, running for re-election for Boone County Southern District Commission. <laughs> I think that's everybody. <laughs> Thank you all. And I'm going to run out. Yes. I will commend you on your proactive stance. You talked about you don't assume people know anything. That is great. So many people just assume, oh, we, we do it this way. Everyone knows what we do. And you're totally in the dark. Right? Appreciate yes, it. Yeah, it does not serve us well to make assumptions about what right. people know. I want to say something before oh, seeing me. Yes, so ma'am. Uh, judge. Jeff Harris, his mother now, and I want yes. to make sure everybody knew about it. It's in it's in my announcement.